Thank you very much, Father, uh, for your introduction and your welcome. I do feel welcomed here in Georgia, um, but uh, in part that's because I do have some good friends here in Savannah that I've wanted to, to visit for a long time, so um, I, I'm, I'm glad that finally this opportunity arose. Um, I, w I, w I won't say that Jacksonville and Savannah are right next door to each other, but it's worth it. It's definitely been worth it so far. So my talk this evening is called What's Really Required for a Eucharistic Revival? Rethinking how we approach the Holy Eucharist. Imagine eating the sun, and imagine you could do it without perishing. What would happen? You would receive into your body the source of light and warmth. You would have within you all the light and heat that you could ever possibly want or need. When we receive Jesus in the most blessed sacrament, we receive the source of all supernatural light and warmth, the light of truth, the warmth of love, for indeed he is the Son of Justice. We receive God himself, the very Son of God, who is inseparable from the Father and the Holy Spirit. Saint Ephraim the Syrian wrote, He called the bread his living body, and he filled it with himself, and his spirit. He who eats it with faith eats fire and spirit. Take and eat this, all of you, and eat with it the Holy Spirit, for it is truly my body, and whoever eats it will have eternal life. That's St. Ephraim. That we are not killed instantly by this contact with eternal and infinite fire is in its own way a greater miracle than would be eating the sun without perishing. Our Lord protects us, courteously hiding his blazing glory lest we be overwhelmed and gently radiating his peace. It is because we receive divine fire, a fire far more potent in the range and reach of its possible spiritual effects than any physical fire, that the worthy reception of the Eucharist is purifying, illuminating, and unitive. The Holy Eucharist does within and upon the soul that which fire does within and upon combustible matter, burning away contrary dispositions and transforming the material into itself. But since the spiritual soul is incorruptible, the soul can become fire without perishing, like the miraculous burning bush. The Eucharist does for the soul what the sun does for the earth, spreading light, warming bodies, causing growth. As we learn from the fathers, doctors, and mystics of the Church, the real presence of Jesus has a proper effect on our soul and our body. Like the healing of the woman with the flow of blood, the diseased blood of the old Adam cannot be healed by any human medicine but only by the touch of the new Adam, the physician of souls. The Lord touches first the essence of the soul, increasing in it the grace that makes the soul pleasing to God, an adopted son of the Father, a bride of the Son, a temple of the Holy Spirit. He touches the powers of the soul, informing them with virtues, strengthening our virtuous habits. Only in the life to come, will we be given to know just how many times it was Jesus who, faced with the laziness of our fallen condition, animated our souls into action and prompted us to bear fruits pleasing to God and profitable to us. As I said, Holy Communion influences the body, too. This is very important to see, even if we cannot understand it completely. By means of the Holy Eucharist, our flesh is made more obedient and docile to our soul, rendered more receptive to the informing power of soul and virtue. The Lord is sown into the flesh as a seed of immortality. He radiates divine life, divine existence, upon what has merely earthly life and earthly existence. His presence is like a beneficial radiation. We know that ordinary radiation causes deformity of cells, but the radiation of the Son of God is exactly the opposite. 
it causes a hidden perfection in cells, in all the matter of the body, so that on the last day, the flesh will be recognized in the sight of God as flesh marked by and belonging to Christ, as flesh worthy and able to be resurrected in the image of the glorified King. He wants to change the flesh day by day into flesh that he will resurrect as if it were his very own. Those who have eaten the Eucharist have eaten the flesh and drunk the blood of him who is the resurrection and the life. Their own flesh and blood is invisibly stamped with the signature, the seal of the eternally living flesh and blood of Jesus. To the all-seeing eyes of God the Father, the man or woman fed on the Eucharist looks different from the one who has not been so fed. Not only in his soul, but in his very flesh, he bears the marks of the Lord Jesus. As St. Thomas says, we receive Christus Passus, the Christ who suffered, who is now glorified. The body that is conformed to the suffering Christ is conformed to his glory, St. Paul tells us. St. John Chrysostom cries out, Let us not, I beg you, slay ourselves by our irreverence, but with awe and purity draw near to it. And when you see it set before you, say to yourself, because of this body I am no longer earth and ashes, no longer a prisoner but free. Because of this I hope for heaven, and I hope to receive the good things therein, immortal life, the portion of angels, the conversation of Christ. That's Chrysostom. It is the faith of the Church. It has always been the faith of the Church, Pace, Protestants, that Jesus is really, truly, substantially, personally present in the most holy sacrament of the altar. Therefore, how we approach and receive Holy Communion is how we approach and receive Jesus Christ himself. It is a personal act, an interpersonal union, a sign of the most intimate friendship, or the opposite, a sign of the most horrible betrayal. When, Je when Judas led the high priests and their guard to apprehend Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus asked him, Friend, why are you here? Would you betray the Son of Man with a kiss? Here, then, is the question we must ask ourselves. Do we believe that Jesus Christ, the Lord of heaven and earth, is truly present in the most holy Eucharist? If so, we can do far more than just follow him at a distance like the timid apostles during the Passion. We can eat the way, the truth, and the life. We can become one with him and allow his reality to shape our very self. The truth we are striving to know and to behold face to face in the beatific vision, that same truth is our food. We can consume it and be one with it. The life we long for, the blessed life, the life of heaven free of suffering and death, this life we can take into ourselves now. That God should give himself, that God should give us himself, is completely beyond our limited understanding, but not at all beyond his unlimited power. The way we seek to follow the gospel way is not a philosophy, but a person, the Word made flesh, and this person gives himself to us. Do we believe he is Emmanuel, God with us, God dwelling in our midst? Hidden, yes, but also real. Indeed, far more real than we are. Let us go to him, let us run to reality, God is the source of all reality, all goodness, all holiness, all happiness. Holy Mass is the sacrifice of Christ made real again in our midst. It is his self-offering and ours, united with his. It brings us the sacrament of his passion, death, and resurrection. And through communion with the Lord himself, we suffer, die, and rise again mystically. 
It may not always feel like the height of one's interior life or one's Christian life, but that is beside the point. Our religion does not consist in feelings or even true thoughts, but communion with mysteries. It is about massive realities too big for our comprehension. God thrusts them upon us, and we respond in the darkness of faith. We have to trust not to our changing feelings or our uncertain thoughts, but his everlasting word, which is the only rock we can safely build on. All this takes place in faith, in the darkness of faith. But as long as we rely on the invincible and infallible promises of Jesus Christ, the Eucharist becomes for us the great reassurance that we are heading toward heaven, as well as the great source of power to reach this goal. As I mentioned a moment ago, Judas betrayed our Lord with a kiss, with a pretend sign of friendship that was actually a death warrant. We do not want to be like Judas, betraying our Lord first by committing mortal sin, and then making our state infinitely worse by receiving him in the midst of, in, in the, midst of the guilt of unconfessed and unforgiven mortal sin. The Council of Trent expressed with incomparable brevity and clarity the reason why we must be concerned to present ourselves worthily for Holy Communion. Quote, It is unfitting to take part in any sacred function without holiness. Assuredly, therefore, the more that Christians perceive the sacredness and divinity of this heavenly sacrament, the more must they take every care not to come to receive it without reverence and holiness especially since we have the frightening words of St. Paul. For those who eat and drink unworthily, eat and drink damnation to themselves, not discerning the Lord's body. Those wishing to receive communion must be reminded of St. Paul's command, let a man examine himself. Unquote. Thus, Trent. The, coll the collective and indiscriminate reception of Holy Communion by all or nearly all Catholics who attend a given Mass, even by those who are not properly disposed to receive the Lord to their benefit, is a major problem straightforwardly acknowledged by the previous two popes. For example, John Paul II wrote, quote, Sometimes, indeed quite frequently, everybody participating in the Eucharistic Assembly goes to Communion, and on some such occasions, as experienced pastors can confirm, there has not been due care to approach the sacrament of penance so as to purify one's conscience." Unquote. While this passage might win an award for understatement, its meaning is unambiguous. Purifying one's conscience through sacramental confession on a regular basis, certainly whenever a grave or mortal sin has been committed, is the only way to guarantee that we are showing proper reverence to our Lord, Jesus Christ, the Holy One of Israel. As the Church teaches, the Eucharist is not a remedy for those whose souls are dead, dead in sin, but a food for those who, being alive, need to be strengthened for the life of charity. Let's put it very concretely, you can put food all day long into a corpse, and it will never do any good. In the spiritual life, it is worse. When a spiritually dead man takes the bread of life, he becomes more guilty. He dies again. He becomes more dead. And the giving of such food to unrepentant public sinners, as when priests or bishops give the Lord to politicians who vote in favor of abortion, heaps burning coals upon the heads of both the recipient and the minister. However, to be conscious of no unrepented grave sin, to have the intention of sinning no more, and to be morally certain that we are in a state of sanctifying grace, is the minimum we can do for so awesome a gift as Jesus Christ himself. Catholic tradition shows us that we should do all in our power to prepare well and to behave ourselves properly when the time comes for communing with the Lord. As regards preparation, we should be fasting before Mass. 
One hour before communion is the minimum required, but the older custom of three hours, or even from midnight, has much to commend it, if Mass is early enough in the day to make it realistic. We should have a right and devout intention, which is defined by the Church as follows. He who approaches the holy table should do so not out of routine or vain glory or human respect, but from a wish to please God, to be more closely united with him by charity, and to have recourse to this divine remedy for his weakness and defects. In other words, the communicant should be conscious of what he is doing and whom he is approaching, hence not from routine and that he is doing it to please the Lord and sanctify his soul through a closer union with him, not because of what others around may be thinking, hence not from vain glory or human respect. The Church also recommends that we should spend time before Mass getting into a recollected and prayerful frame of mind to the best of our ability. And that, of course, means that Music musicians shouldn't be warming up right before Mass. They should be quiet in the Church. The Mass itself should be such as to assist us in this process of preparing for the encounter with the Lord. It does so traditionally by emphasizing the adoration of God, contrition for our sins, and the remembrance of what Christ has done for us, as well as by providing plenty of silence within which to make these interior acts. It is for sure the case that spending time after Mass and Thanksgiving greatly augments the effect that communion will have in our lives. Rushing straight out of the Church after Mass is almost a guarantee of a poor harvest, as we can expect from a garden that receives insufficient watering and fertilizer. As regards behaving properly towards the Eucharist, this, of course, is a much more controversial topic in the Catholic Church today. And so I'm going to drill into this in some detail and make an argument for traditional practices. For most of history, Latin Rite Catholics have received communion on the tongue and in a kneeling posture. Let's look at kneeling first. In his commentary on the letter to the Ephesians, St. Thomas Aquinas underlines the intimate connection between kneeling and humility. Quote, Humility makes a prayer worthy of being heard, and kneeling is a symbol of humility for two reasons. First, a man belittles himself in a certain way when he bends the knee, and he subjects himself to the one he kneels before. In such a way, he recognizes his own weakness and insignificance. Secondly, physical strength is present in the knees. In bending them, a man confesses openly to his lack of strength. Thus, external physical symbols are shown to God for the purpose of renewing and spiritually training the inner soul. Unquote. Traditional Christian liturgies of East and West dramatically emphasize God's transcendence over us, his benevolent reign, his rightful demand of our whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our corresponding duty to worship him by offering sacrifice with contrite and humble hearts. In spite of the illusions fostered by modern democracy, we are not equals before Jesus Christ. He is our Lord and Master, and we are his disciples, servants, and adorers. Yes, he lovingly calls us his friends, but he is not just any friend. He is the Lord of heaven and earth who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light, and who deserves and rewards our absolute self-surrender, which no creature can rightly deserve or demand or receive. This is why kneeling, with a tradition that has long expressed and cultivated the attitude of humility by means of it, is no mere external, incidental external feature that we can take or leave. It is part of our fundamental spiritual discipline. Kneeling is a vivid and heartfelt expression of worship, of the adoration that is due to our Lord. The devil knows this too. 
According to Abba Apollo, a desert father who lived about 1,700 years ago, the devil has no knees. He cannot kneel. He cannot adore. He cannot pray. He can only look down his nose in contempt. Being unwilling to bend the knee at the name of Jesus is the essence of evil. And don't take my word for that. That's what Isaiah says in the letter to the Romans. Note how well everything fits together in the Roman liturgy as it developed over the centuries. As long as communion is given on the tongue, there is good reason to kneel, not only for its symbolic and formative value, but also because kneeling makes it easier for the priest or deacon to place the host on the tongue. And once this becomes a practice, a communion rail is obviously helpful, not only to affirm the symbolic distinction between the sanctuary and the nave, but also to offer bodily support to those who are kneeling. Moreover, the priest is always to be accompanied by a server holding a paten, out of respect for the Blessed Sacrament, and lest it or any fragment of it should fall to the ground. All of these related customs grew up in support of each other. Once the fundamental principle was allowed to breathe freely, namely that our Lord Jesus Christ is really present in the most holy sacrament of the altar. If at the name of Jesus, if at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bend, all the more should our knees bend when it is Jesus himself before whom we come. As we see throughout the New Testament, whenever people come up to him to profess their faith and ask his help. This, this is the kneeling before Christ is throughout the New Testament. Benedict XVI once said, Kneeling in adoration before the Eucharist is the most valid and radical remedy against the idolatries of yesterday and today. Thank you, Pope Benedict, for speaking so clearly. That is also why, if I may slightly digress, the practice of adoration of the Blessed Sacrament outside of Mass is so crucial a part of any authentic Eucharistic revival. As the same Pope liked to remind us, we grow in faith and love for the Lord when we spend time in his presence. It's like every other friendship in that respect. And we have an opportunity of making reparation for the sins of those who do not believe in his real presence, or who treat it with contempt or indifference, or even as a political token. We do not hear the word reparation nearly enough. It is thought to be too old-fashioned, or perhaps the concept of reparation is simply unknown. And yet, the entire work of our Lord Jesus Christ was a work of reparation, the work of repairing fallen human nature and repairing the broken relationship between God and man. He is the reparator par excellence. And when we fast, abstain, keep vigil, make holy hours, or do other penances, we enter more deeply into his work of redemption, of reparation, for the liberation of souls and the glorification of the Father. On the basis of what we learn from church history and the revelations of countless mystics, of whom St. Margaret Mar Mary Alacoque comes principally to mind, we can be quite certain there will never be any revival without earnest and widespread reparation for sins committed against the Most Blessed Sacrament. The United States bishops certainly ought to know that, but apparently they are almost as badly informed at times as their flocks are. We need to pray for them. Resuming our main topic, a next point to focus on is that the priest's hands are specially consecrated with holy oil in his ordination so that he may fittingly handle the Blessed Sacrament, may touch and administer the holy gifts of the altar. In the words of Pope John Paul II, quote, one must not forget the primary office of priests who have been consecrated by their ordination to represent Christ the priest. For this reason, their hands, like their words and their will, have become the direct instruments of Christ. Through this fact, that is, as ministers of the Holy Eucharist, they have a primary responsibility for the sacred species. 
because it is a total responsibility. They offer the bread and wine, they consecrate it, and then they distribute the sacred species to the participants in the assembly who wish to receive them. How eloquent, therefore, is the right of the anointing of the hands in our Latin ordination, as though precisely for these hands a special grace and power of the Holy Spirit is necessary. To touch the sacred species and to distribute them with their own hands is a privilege of the ordained." Unquote. A layman's hands, in contrast, are not anointed in this way because no simple layman represents Christ the priest in the Mass and serves as his direct instrument. A third point is receiving on the tongue. It is absolutely fitting that Christ's faithful should go before the ordained minister who represents him and receive on bended knee and with open mouth the nourishment of body and soul, like a baby bird fed in the nest by its parent, or like a child too young to feed itself. From this symbolic vantage, it is wholly inappropriate that the priest put the host into our hands so that we may then administer communion to ourselves. This gesture means I'm grown up and I can feed myself, thank you very much. But this is false. We cannot feed ourselves supernaturally. In the prophet Ezekiel, we read, Open your mouth and eat that which I will give you. In the Psalms, we read, Open wide your mouth and I will fill it. Who is the I in these statements? It is the Lord. The Lord alone may feed us, his children. Only Christ, the high priest, can give us the bread of life and his ordained minister acts in his place, set apart by holy orders, and with hands likewise set apart for a task of divine bestowal. In fact, so pervasive and profound was the Church's reverence towards Christ our God in his holy sacrament that she even forbade the laity to touch the vessels that touched Christ. The Catechism of the Council of Trent the Magisterium's first universal catechism, published in 1566, and obviously still authoritative as a witness to the faith, as John Paul II said in his introduction to the New Catechism. Uh, the Catechism of Trent explained this point with unanswerable logic. Quote, To safeguard in every possible way the dignity of so august a sacrament, not only is the power of its administration entrusted exclusively to priests, but the Church has also prohibited by law any but consecrated persons, unless some case of grave necessity intervene, to dare to handle or touch the sacred vessels, the linen or other instruments necessary to its completion. Priests themselves and the rest of the faithful may hence understand how great should be the piety and holiness of those who approach to consecrate, administer, or receive the Eucharist." Unquote. The Magisterium of the Church, as recently as the instruction Memoriale Domini of the Congregation for Divine Worship from 1969, approved by Paul VI, defended communion on the tongue, defended communion on the tongue, a practice that the vast majority of the world's bishops, when polled at that time by Paul VI, agreed should continue. Now here's a, here's a big quotation from Memoriale Domini, very important. Quote, In view of the state of the Church as a whole today, this manner of distributing Holy Communion, that is, on the tongue and kneeling, must be retained, not only because it rests upon a tradition of many centuries, but especially because it is a sign of the reverence of the faithful towards the Eucharist. This practice in no way detracts from the personal dignity of those who approach this great sacrament, and it is part of the preparation needed for the most fruitful reception of the Lord's body. I, th that last sentence might be a bit curious to you, when it says that this practice in no way detracts from the dignity of those who, who do it. There were theologians in the 1960s who were saying it's unworthy, it's it's childish, it's unworthy of adults to kneel down and be fed by somebody else. 
And, and, and the, the congregation for divine worship is saying here, no, that's not true. That's not true. OK, continuing with the quotation. This reference is a sign of Holy Communion, not in common bread and drink, but in the body and blood of the Lord. In addition, this manner of communicating, which is now to be considered as prescribed by custom, gives more effective assurance that Holy Communion will be distributed with the appropriate reverence, decorum, and dignity. That any danger of profaning the Eucharistic species in which the whole and entire Christ, God and man, is substantially contained and permanently present in a unique way, will be avoided. And finally, that the diligent care which the Church has always commended for the very fragments of the consecrated bread will be maintained. If you have allowed anything to be lost, consider this a lessening of your own members. That last sentence is a quotation from a, a church father. So that's what the Congregation for Divine Worship was saying in 1969. This last point is very important. Studies done with black gloves have shown that hosts, even when designed to be compact and firm, still shed particles. Some brands of hosts are more crumbly than others, and sometimes particular hosts can become damaged so that they fragment more easily. Anyone with extensive experience handling or watching the handling of hosts knows that this is true. Over the centuries, the church was careful to develop practices and rubrics that guaranteed that fragments would always be caught on linen or metal and then consumed. In the modern way of distributing hosts directly into people's hands, there's a serious problem of the scattering of particles, not to mention other horror stories about evil people who take away hosts, or confused individuals who don't know what to do with the host and put it in a hymnal or in a purse, or sell it on eBay. That is why I maintain that even if it is possible to imagine a tightly controlled situation in which reception in the hand might not run the risk of sacrilege, it is impossible to avoid sacrilege when this practice is carried out on a large scale over long periods of time. To this day, the universal norm is communion on the tongue, with communion in the hand as an indult or a special permission. It is a permission that should never have been given, and it must someday be rescinded when the church on earth is better governed than it is at present. We must do everything in our power, with patience, yes, but also with a perseverance that never quits, to overturn the practice of communion in the hand and all the aberrations that have accompanied it, replacing them with worthier customs, such as reception on the tongues, on the tongues of the kneeling faithful, administered by the clergy alone. Such customs cannot, in and of themselves, prevent unworthy communions from happening. That's something that it depends on the heart and the conscience of the individual. But certain evils will be limited or eliminated, and the goods of supernatural faith, interior devotion, and external reverence will greatly increase and multiply. What can I do, you might be asking yourself. Well, the one thing all of us can do, lay people, is to make a firm commitment to receiving only on the tongue and kneeling, no matter what mass we attend or where. So far, so good. But if you bring up this topic with other Catholics, I can guarantee that you will run into the following objection. Well, maybe not with everyone you talk to, but with certain people. Didn't the ancient church practice communion in the hand standing? If they did, why shouldn't we? The answer is, yes, it once happened, and no, it wasn't our way of doing it. Let's look into it more closely. There's a famous text from a church father, St. Cyril of Jerusalem, who lived in the fourth century, which is quoted again and again by proponents of the modern communion practice. Now, it's interesting, by the way, that we have hundreds of church fathers, and this is the only substantial text on communion in the hand. So that, that itself is worthy of note, but I'm not going to comment on that any further. 
So St. Cyril writes in his mystagogical catechesis, quote, coming up to receive, therefore, do not approach with your wrists extended or your fingers splayed, but make your left hand a throne for the right, for it is about to receive a king. And cupping your palm, so receive the body of Christ and answer, Amen. Carefully hallow your eyes by the touch of the sacred body, and then partake, taking care to lose no part of it. Such a loss would be like a mutilation of your own body. Why, if you had been given gold dust, would you not take the utmost care to hold it fast, not letting a single grain slip through your fingers, lest you be by so much the poorer? How much more carefully, then, will you guard against losing so much as a crumb of that which is more precious than gold and precious stones? Unquote. Very interesting passage. We should take note of several things about this passage. First, the extreme carefulness that St. Cyril demands of the one about to receive the Lord himself, the king. Not a speck of the consecrated bread should be lost. That would be like a mutilation of one's body, a loss of something more precious than any created thing. It was, in fact, this very emphasis on the immense care to be taken toward the Eucharist, together with an ever-deepening appreciation of the sheer magnitude of so divine a gift, that led the Church over time to abandon communion in the hand and to prefer communion directly in the mouth. This is a primary example of what is called the organic development of the liturgy, which pursues the implications of an original belief or attitude until the external expression most perfectly reflects and inculcates that belief or attitude. Conversely, the artificial return to a much earlier but long since discontinued practice, and one that now, reappearing in a very different context, carries with it overtones of casualness and lack of faith in the real presence, is a primary example of the error of antiquarianism condemned in 1947 by Pius XII in his encyclical Mediator Dei. So I hope that makes sense, what I'm saying, that it's the very attitude in St. Cyril that eventually led the Church to abolish communion in the hand. It's the same attitude that led to that organically. And then a thousand years or more later to try to go back artificially to an ancient custom, that's, that's a mistake because it's not recognizing the way that the Church actually progresses in her knowledge and in her practice of, of worship. Second, if we look more carefully at what Cyril describes and combine this passage with other hints from antiquity, we can see that even when communion in the hand was practiced, it involved marks of reverence that curiously never accompanied its reintroduction in the late 1960s. It is significant that the Eucharist laid on the right hand is not then received by means of the less valued left hand, but rather directly by the mouth. What appears at first glance to be communion in the hand reveals itself on closer inspection to be communion in the mouth with the right hand serving as a sort of pattern. Bishop Cyril's description shows that the attitude of the communicant, then, is not one of taking and capturing, but rather of reverent and humble reception accompanied by a sign of adoration. So let me try to illustrate this for you, okay? So what Cyril is describing is not it, you never receive in your left hand, okay? That doesn't, in the, in the, for all of ancient Christianity, the left is, is, is a symbol of evil. You, you would not receive the Eucharist in the left hand. So you would receive in the right hand, and then you would bow down and, and take it with your mouth off of your right hand. Okay, that's, so it's using your right hand like a pattern. It's fixed in place. Uh, the Eucharist is placed there, and you bow down and you lift it out of your hand. Right? And if this sounds strange, all you have to do is, well, if you go to a Byzantine liturgy and you happen to be sitting in such a way that you can see the priest, after when he's cleansing the vessels, he will lick his fingers as well. This is something that they still do in the East. In the West, we've developed a sort of a more, a tamer way with pouring water. Yeah, exactly. Um, 
So yes, so that's what Cyril is describing, not at all what people do today. Bishop Athanasius Schneider, an expert in patristics, writes, quote, The practice had a different form in ancient times than it does today. The Holy Eucharist was received on the palm of the right hand, and the faithful were not allowed to touch the Holy Host with their fingers, but they had to bow down their head to the palm of the hand and take the sacrament directly with their mouth, thus in a position of a profound bow and not standing upright. The common practice today is to receive the Eucharist standing upright, taking it with the left hand. This is something which symbolically the Church Fathers would find horrific. How could the Holy of Holies be taken with the left hand? What is more, today the faithful take and touch the host directly with their fingers and then put the host in the mouth. This gesture has never been known in the entire history of the Catholic Church, but was invented by, guess who, Calvin. Not even by Martin Luther. The Calvinists, who do not believe at all in the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, invented a rite which is devoid of almost all gestures of sacredness and of exterior adoration. That is, the Calvinists receive what they call communion, standing upright and touching the bread with their fingers and putting it in their mouth in the way people treat ordinary food. For them, this was just a symbol. So their exterior behavior towards communion was similar to behavior towards a symbol. That is, they didn't want it to look like they, that you believe that this is God. Right? During the Second Vatican Council, Catholic modernists, especially in the Netherlands, took this Calvinistic communion rite and wrongly attributed it to the early church in order to spread it more easily throughout the church. We have to dismantle this myth and these insidious tactics. Unquote. Bishop Schneider. No mincer of words, he. Moreover, in the early church, a communion cloth was, at least in some places and times, laid over the hands of recipients so that they would not directly touch the Holy Sacrament and any fragments could be easily gathered. The Byzantine rite still utilizes such a cloth held under the chins of those who are receiving in their mouths from a spoon handled by the priest. Some traditional parishes retain the use of a houseling cloth that covers the communion rail. While the invention of the so-called chin pattern renders the houseling cloth no longer necessary, traditional Catholic churches and chapels often retain it as an additional reminder of the sacredness of this Eucharistic banquet and the symbolic link between the people's reception of the Lord and the cloth-covered altar of sacrifice on which the divine victim has been offered. This houseling cloth underlines that they, like the priest, are partaking of a mystical sacrifice. In short, the ancient record bears witness to beliefs and attitudes that would, over time, develop into the long-standing communion customs of both the Latin West and the Byzantine East. In the West, communion on the tongue kneeling is the natural and suitable result of St. Cyril's Eucharistic piety. The attempt to turn back the clock to antiquity, an antiquity, moreover, deceptively misrepresented and fictitiously reconstructed, is, in the end, nothing but a Trojan horse for Calvinistic sacramental theology. What is at stake, therefore, is no minor issue of personal preference or private devotion, but precisely those distinctively Catholic dogmas at the center of our faith that many surveys in recent years show are being rapidly abandoned by a majority of Catholics, even among those who still attend Mass regularly. Undoubtedly, poor catechesis outside of Mass is part of the explanation, but the single greatest catechizer in the Church is the liturgy itself, as it forms the minds and hearts of worshipers week in and week out. If Mass is celebrated in a way that does not have us consistently and obviously behaving toward the Eucharist exactly as we would toward the risen Christ himself, then no other solutions will ever fix this problem with all the sins that follow in its wake. The only path to a true Eucharistic revival is to abandon these harmful, 
heresy-induced practices from the 1960s and 1970s, and to restore our traditional customs of utmost reverence toward the bread of angels. There is nothing complicated about this. It's as clear as day. Let us avoid sophistry and cowardice and beating around the bush and call a spade a spade. Sometimes one will also hear a silly objection that goes like this. Why do you think the tongue is holier than the hand? If you are in a state of grace, your hands are as holy as your tongue. Or the related objection, what matters is what's inside our hearts, not what we do with our bodies. As long as you believe in and love Jesus, it doesn't matter whether you stand or kneel, etc. Anyone who has been paying the slightest attention up until now can see right away that these objections totally miss the point. What we do with our bodies during worship both expresses the attitude in our soul, what we believe we are doing, and helps to shape our attitude the right way. Everyone recognizes this fact in every other area of life. A man would not propose marriage to a woman in the same way as he stands in line at the post office to buy stamps. A mother would not handle her baby roughly or negligently and make the excuse that it's only the love in my heart that matters, not what I do outwardly. A president would not go before Congress wearing swim trunks and speak slang. Actually, one, one wonders what presidents might do nowadays. <laughs> we all instinctively know that our bodily disposition, clothing, and behavior tells others and even tells ourselves what we are doing and why it's important or not important to us. It is just obvious that kneeling for Western people is a sign of reverence. Even the Novus Ordo requires that the faithful kneel for the duration of the Eucharistic prayer of the Mass. How bizarre is it that we would kneel for the time when our Lord comes into our midst on the altar at the hands of the priest, but we would not kneel for our Lord when we come right before him to receive him? That's what I call backwards and upside down. I mean, in fact, it would make more sense to stand during the Eucharistic prayer and kneel for communion. I mean, if you had to choose one or the other, right? And how bizarre that we would think it beautiful for newlyweds to feed each other cake or for a mother to feed a child, and yet we would not recognize that Christ, our bridegroom, is here to feed us and that the church, our mother, is offering us this nourishment from her abundance. But there is more. The tongue, as a matter of fact, was specially blessed by the church in the traditional rite of baptism. And wherever this traditional rite continues to be used, we will see it happen. A pinch of exercised and blessed salt is placed on the infant's tongue with a command that looks ahead to the reception of communion. Accipe sal sapientiae, propitiatio sit tibi in vitam eternam. Receive the salt of wisdom. May it be propitious to you unto eternal life. Followed by this prayer. O God of our fathers, O God, the author of all truth, vouchsafe, we humbly beseech thee, to look graciously down upon this thy servant, and as he tastes this first nutriment of salt, suffer him no longer to hunger for want of heavenly food, to the end that he may be always fervent in spirit, rejoicing in hope, always serving thy name. Lead him, O Lord, we beseech thee, to the labor of the new regeneration, that Together with thy faithful, he may deserve to attain the everlasting rewards of thy promises. No other part of the body is set aside in this manner for blessed food. The salt may be seen as a symbolic substitute for communion, or an anticipation and preparation for the Eucharist for the one who cannot yet receive it. It is no wonder that the removal of this precious ancient ceremony from the modern rite of baptism more or less coincided with the toleration of communion in the hand. So it's the same people working towards these things. Now, all that I have said until now points to one conclusion. 
the Catholic Church knew what it was doing for the past thousand years and more in regard to how the clergy and the faithful should treat the Most Holy Eucharist. Let's briefly review how the traditional Latin Mass practices and thereby inculcates utmost reverence for the Most Holy Eucharist and in this way serves as the gold standard for any liturgy we celebrate. In order to prevent the scattering of any particles and to remind himself of the awesomeness of what he is doing, the priest holds his thumb and forefinger together after the consecration of the host and keeps them thus until the careful ablutions after communion. He bows and genuflects many times towards the Blessed Sacrament. His anointed hands are the only ones that touch the sacred species and distribute them to the faithful who receive on their tongue kneeling in a posture of humble submission. This millennium-old practice of kneeling before the Holy One of Israel and of receiving him on the tongue from the hand of an ordained minister literally embodies our dependency on God, our lowliness and unworthiness, our need to fall in adoration before the Lord, and our desire for healing and elevation. You can't be lifted up until you're first down, and you can be lifted up. In the supernatural domain, we are all children who need to be fed by the Father, fed with the bread that is his Son. Accurate catechesis is good. Accurate homilies are also good. Diocesan and national programs are good. But none of these is enough, or even of lasting value. What is needed above all is a permanent form of liturgy that cries out real presence and humbles itself to the dust in adoration. What is needed, in short, is reverential fear. As the psalmist, psalmist says, Servite domino in timore et exultate ei cum tremore. Serve ye the Lord with fear and rejoice unto him with trembling. God's merciful closeness gives us no cause for abandoning reverential fear and expressions of our smallness, dependency, and need for purification. Quite the contrary, since in modern times man exalts himself far too highly for false reasons, he must be even more reminded of his true place before the Divine Majesty. Another way the revival of the traditional Mass helps us today is by presenting to us a ritual that is manifestly ordered to the worship of God himself, rather than seeming to be directed to the people. One of the widespread errors of our age is the belief that Mass is more or less a fancied-up communion service for the sake of getting the Eucharist, so much so that it is thought strange to attend Mass without going up for communion. Am I right? That's certainly a common view. Undoubtedly, the union of the members of the mystical body of Christ with their head is included in the purpose of Mass. But we can receive communion also outside of Mass, as when it is brought to the sick in the hospital or to soldiers on a battlefield. The primary purpose of the Mass as such is to adore, praise, placate, and supplicate the Most Holy Trinity. It is the perfect act of divine worship by which the Father is well pleased with the Son. Through it, the Church militant receives an outpouring of grace, the Church triumphant an increase of joy, the Church suffering an alleviation of pains. The truth of the inherent value of the Mass was better understood in olden times when people spoke of assisting at Mass. We assist in this outpouring of grace, this increase, this alleviation, by our presence and our personal prayer united to the Holy Sacrifice. We are already mightily blessed simply to be there for this august mystery, this all-worthy offering. Even if there were nothing else in it for us, so to speak, the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass all by itself would give us matter for a lifetime of thanksgiving, or more truly, an eternity. In heaven, the communion we enjoy with God is so perfect, there is no need any more for sacraments. Yet the worship of the mystical body still continues, the Son still offering his divine humanity and his holy wounds to the Father 
and we offering ourselves with him. In conclusion, when a community is lacking a solid, reliable, inflexible center, a core identity, it begins to crumble around the edges like a garment that unravels when the seam is torn. This has happened in the Catholic Church in the past half century, when far too many Catholics have lost their core identity as sons of God, soldiers of Christ, citizens of the city of God, heirs of immortality, sharers in the offering of divine worship, prophets of truth, and kings over their bodies and other earthly realities. The fundamental reason for this confusion or amnesia about who we are and what we are supposed to be doing is, in my opinion, the devastation wrought upon the central act of the Catholic religion, the holy sacrifice of the Mass and all that happens during it. If the Mass is as it should be, everything else eventually falls into place behind it or will gather around it like bits of iron around a powerful magnet. The whole of Christian civilization, as John Sr. says, was essentially built around the Mass and the Holy Eucharist. The world should minister to the altar and the tabernacle. If we get this wrong, it's as if the soul has departed from the body. The body starts decomposing, and nothing we can do makes it come alive again, except breathing the soul back into it, as our Lord did for his friend Lazarus. As he once said, Lazarus, come forth, Jesus says to his church today, my people come forth from the tomb in which you have buried yourselves by compromises with the world, by surrendering to the flesh, by collaborating with the devil in the destruction of Christian civilization and Catholic culture. Come forth and live again the life you once knew. I will make you whole again. Good physicians go straight to the cause of the disease. We too must do the same. Our disease is the trivialization, secularization, and democratization of the mass. This disease can be healed only by applying its contraries, the exaltation of the beauty, mystery, majesty, and holiness of the mass, the resacralization of it, so to speak, by the recovery of its rich tradition of prayers and music, ceremonies, and customs, the bold reaffirmation of the special place of the clergy and of exclusively male ministry in the sanctuary. When the Mass shines forth once again as the glorious pinnacle of our life together, when the clergy approach it as the holy mountain and the burning bush, in awe, with head bowed and vanity slain, when the laity enter into it as into a spiritual garden of Eden where they may taste the sweetest fruit of the tree of life, then, and only then, will the renewal of the church for which we hope and pray begin in earnest. The church's greatest theologian, St. Thomas Aquinas, teaches that the common good of the entire universe is contained in the Holy Eucharist. If we care about our souls, and beyond that, our families and the parishes of which we are members of the universal church and indeed of all mankind, we will orient our lives around the worthy celebration of this awesome sacrifice and will do our utmost to partake worthily of it. So, so there, are, there are two meanings of worthy. This is very important. The church actually makes this distinction. Um, there's the absolute worthiness of God. And guess what? Only God is absolutely worthy of God, right? Um, but then there's the, the relative worthiness of doing what we can to remove the obstacles to his grace. And that's when the church teaches, and by the way, this is solemn doc dogma. This is not opinion that we must be, to the best of our knowledge, we must be free from the guilt of mortal sin. And that's the minimum worthiness that we're talking about here. Right? So definitely not absolute worthiness. In that, we're all, we all need to say, Lord, I am not worthy, because we can always become holier, and we can always become more full of charity.
please don't misunderstand me. I'm definitely not saying that if it's difficult or even impossible for someone to kneel, they, of course they shouldn't kneel at that point because that's not, they're not choosing not to kneel. You have to kneel with your heart at that point, right? Um, but I'm, I'm speaking more about, I, I think it's fair to say the majority of the faithful who come would be able to kneel. And I'm just giving a defense of why that's an externally appropriate you know, sign. Um, so, of course, I, I alluded to that poll in my talk, uh, the, the famous Pew Research study, and, and that's not the only one. There are other studies that point in the same direction. Excuse me. Um, I, think, I think that the numbers certainly wouldn't be any better right now than they were just a few years ago. Um, I can't say if they would be worse. Um, I don't know on what basis I would say that. What I do know is that mass attendance right now is significantly down. Um, and that, uh, I mean, you know, I'm sorry, I might offend some of you by saying this, but, but I, I think it was catastrophic for the U.S. bishops to shut down churches and to stop masses and to give the impression that the mass and the sacraments were inessential services. That, that was a catastrophic error. <clears throat> Um, but in terms of, of the future, I, I regret to say that, well, let's just say I'm, I'm a bit of a pessimist and a bit of an optimist. Uh, maybe that just means I'm a realist, I don't know. Uh, but I, I'm a pessimist in the short term and an optimist in the long term. Um, in the short term, I, I think that, uh, and again, I, you know, I, I feel like I might be walking on eggshells here, uh, given that there's a diverse audience. but. Um, but I think that there, there are some people who are so deeply committed to certain ideas that became popular after the Second Vatican Council that they will not rethink them. They will not crit critique them. They won't let them go. And they'll hold on to them um, for as long as they can. And I think that that's, that's been... The, the, the da a lot of damage has been done because unlike a corporation that has to keep examining whether its policies are working and whether it's making a profit, so to speak, the church, and this I think is part of false, this is part of clericalism, a clericalist culture, the church in a sense has the luxury or can imagine that it has the luxury of not assessing itself the way a corporation has to assess itself. And so, uh, I mean, I love this, this, this analogy because I think it's quite true. Uh, you know, when Coca-Cola came out with new Coke, right, they, it flopped it dramatically, and it wasn't working. And what did they do? Well, they didn't just stick to their guns and say, well, people have to like the new Coke. They just made the old Coke again. <laughs> um, and, and therefore, I'm not really surprised that so many of the younger generation, you know, I'm in my early 50s, but when I go to the local Latin mass, it's packed with young people, 20-something-year-olds, 20, 30-something-year-olds, 20 lots of children. Um, you know, per capita, uh, much more than any of the other parishes. Why is that happening? I think it's because these people don't have the same baggage and they don't have the same um, assumptions. Uh, they don't. They don't. They're not attracted by guitar masses. They're not attracted by looseness and casualness. They're attracted by reverence, by order, by discipline, by 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 serious prayer. Because right now, to be a Catholic is to be countercultural. And so we don't need more of the secular culture. We need more of a countercultural reaction. And this is something already John Paul II was saying in Benedict XVI. Um, so the reason I'm optimistic in the long run is that I think that this countercultural movement towards tradition or from tradition back to tradition um, is, is, a, is going to it's gonna stay strong and it's going to get stronger over time. Right? Um, that's I think that's just plain from a sociological analysis, really. There's a lot packed into that question, obviously. Uh, so let me take let me pull up a chair here. You got a few hours. Um, no, I mean, I think that the problem with the Second Vatican Council is that from very early on, even during the council, even during its first session in 1962, uh, it already had become a sort of ideological football 
that different people were trying to run home to their own, you know, to, they were trying to score points with the council. Um, and, and this is what Benedict XVI often referred to uh, what he called the council of the media or the para-council. The, there, there were many things attributed to the council that cannot be found in either the speeches of the, of the fathers of the council or in the promulgated documents of it. Um, and yet this penumbra uh, was created around the council that exercised its own magnetic force. And, it, and, and in some ways, I mean, in, in many ways, the, the, um, the progressive, let's call it the progressive interpretation of the council became much more important than anything that was actually said or written by the council, said at or written by the council. Um, and so we've, uh, part of our problem is that, is that when you ask um, when will Vatican II be implemented, you then immediately have to ask, will the real Vatican II please stand up? And, 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 and who gets to decide what the real Vatican Council, Second Vatican Council is? Well, if you, I mean, you might say, um, you know, well, the Pope gets to decide that. That seems like a reasonable Catholic answer. Well, John Paul II and Benedict XVI interpreted it in one way, and Pope Francis is now interpreting it in a quite different way. And although you can find an overlap, like a Venn diagram, there are still very strong differences between the last, uh, among the last, actually the last four popes, even you could say the last five popes. Because when you read John the Twenty-Third's opening speech, Gaudet Mater Ecclesia, from October 11th, 1962, you read that and your mouth hits the ground because the way he's describing the council, he says, you know, the council is going to be built on the firm doctrine of Trent and Vatican I, and it's going to reiterate the perennial teaching of the church for modern man in a way he can understand, um, you know, and, and I mean, it, it, it talks about the council in a way that doesn't match the impression that almost anybody now has of, the, of what the council either accomplished or how it was implemented. Um, I mean, I, it, it might have accomplished what John XXIII said, it might, but it certainly wasn't implemented in the spirit in which John XXIII spoke about it. And I, you can just look at the document yourself, Gaudet Mater Crazy, I'm not making this up. Um, so even just to say, well, who gets to interpret the Second Vatican Council, even to say the Pope is no longer a satisfactory answer, right? At least not pra practically speaking or pragmatically speaking. It takes you in different directions. Um, and then if somebody says, well, it's not just the Pope's, it's only the current Pope. Um, you know, and, and if the current pope decides to go in a quite different direction, then I guess we all have to just turn about and follow him. I, I'm sorry, but to me, this so that starts to sound like Mormonism, and you know, and the president of the Mormons saying, "Okay, now we can drink caffeinated beverages," you know, before they were forbidden. You know, that is to say, uh, there's a kind of hyper papalism there that that is would be mocked by Protestants. They would think, do you not have intellect? Are you not trying to be coherent with yourselves? Are you going to disagree today with what you agreed with yesterday just because the Pope says so? I mean, that, that's, that seems like a caricature of the papacy. It is a caricature of the papacy. I've, I've got a book about that back there, actually, called The Road from Hyperpapalism to Catholicism. Um, you know, I, 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 I don't shy away from controversy when I title my books. So that one kind of tells you right away what, what, the, uh, what the thesis is. Um, so I actually think that I think Bishop Schneider is the best commentator on Vatican II, actually. If you read his book, he has a book called Christus Vincit, which I, I can't recommend it highly enough. It's such a good book. It's a really beautiful, entertaining read and very enlightening, too. Um, but it's, a, it's an interview book with Bishop Schneider and Diane Montagna is asking him some really great questions, you know, like those old interviews with Ratzinger that we all enjoyed, um, Petrus Seewald and Ratzinger. Um, and uh, she asks him a whole bunch of questions about Vatican II. And basically what he says is, there are several luminous teachings of Vatican II that will remain in the church and will continue to, to, to remain for all time, like the teaching on the universal call to holiness for everyone. Um, he, of course, points out immediately that this is not something novel with the council. I mean, you can find that in, in uh, St. Uh, Francis de Sales. You can find that in St. Thomas Aquinas. So it's not new, but it was newly stated and stated with quite a bit of force and with more clarity than it had ever been stated by the magisterium before. So Bishop Snyder gives a few examples of what he calls luminous truths. And then he says, there are a few examples of really 
poorly written parts of Vatican II that are, that are actually problematic, like when it says Christians and Muslims adore the one same God. He says this is a problematic, this is problematic because adoration for Christians is something supernatural. It's based upon the, the infused virtue of faith. It is divine adoration. Adoration for Muslims is a natural adoration. It's something that any pagan can give to God. They're, 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 it's, that's an equivocation. Christians and Muslims do not adore the same God in the same way. Right? So there are luminous truths. There are problems. And then he says there's a whole bunch of stuff that's going to be completely forgotten. Right? And should that shock us? No. There have been 21 ecumenical councils in the history of the church, and most of what most of them have, have said has been forgotten. Okay? And that's not like a, a, a horrible thing. M much of what councils deal with are particular issues at a particular time. You know, like, what are we going to do with the Knights Templar? You know, well, have you seen any Knights Templars around lately? Well, if not, then that teaching isn't going to be applicable anymore. You know? Um, and, uh, you know, if, if you, like, Dignitatis Humanae opens up with the statement that modern man is increasingly aware of the dignity of the human person. Well, sorry, in 2022, that ain't true anymore. That is as irrelevant as Methuselah, okay? So th that's, that's what I mean by saying, you know, it's, it's a mixture. Councils are mixtures. Um, and it's especially, Vatican II is, is something we should especially not be worried about um, because it, according to Paul VI, said this very clearly, it issued no definitive teaching. It issued no dogmas. It did not teach with, uh, with, with dogmatic decrees. Um, it did not define anything of the Catholic faith, and it did not anathematize any errors. Um, and so, although there is teaching there, for sure, it's magisterial, it's not like all the earlier councils that actually defined the things that Catholics must believe in order to be saved, and things that they must not believe in order to be saved, right? Um, so that's, that's my answer. Yeah, okay, so there's, it's a complicated question, but um, I think, no, but it's a good one, it's a good one. Um, I mean, the, fir the first point I would make is, is that in the history of the church, it typically hasn't, the solution for spiritual problems or even psychological problems has typically been dealt with in a multi-pronged manner over a long period of time, and not by what you could call top-down bureaucratic solutions. And, and that, I think, I think that it's typical of modern Western people we do this all the time in politics. We think the government can fix the problem of poverty, for example. And so the government builds horrible housing projects, and they throw money at poor people, and they do all these things, and it actually ends up often making the problem much worse, right? And that's because the problem can only be dealt with in many different ways, in many subtle ways, and, and different directions, kinds of ways, and better coming from below than from above, um, imposed. And so it seems to me that although you can find what maybe what could be called bureaucratic solutions at different moments in the history of the church, it has typically been movements started by saints or even something like the liturgical movement, which had a good healthy phase of educating the faithful and, and equipping them to engage the liturgy better. Um, and, and, you know, and the retreats that were once so plentifully offered. And, and like, if you read, I read a lot of, of church history, and it just seems like when you read about the church from, like, basically from the, from the 19th century into the 20th century, there were parish missions going on all the time, it seems like, and they were often very well attended. Um, I'm not, you know what I mean? So it seems like things were being done to try to address the issues, but I think that modern people are very impatient with these slow organic processes, and there were definitely people at the council who thought, if we only do X, Y, and Z, we can completely revitalize and reawaken everybody and, and re-energize everything and win modern man. And, and I just, it didn't happen. And I think it could have been predicted that it wouldn't happen that way. Um, I hope that's some, something of an answer. Um, the, the, if those attitudes, if there, are, if there are, let's say, if there are Jansenistic attitudes present, which I would just say, let's not even call it Jansenism, let's just say fallen human beings tend to fall into certain almost predictable patterns. Um, 
you know, and I think they need to, they, those things would need to be addressed. However, they could be um, from in homilies from the pulpit in the confessional, at least briefly, um, you know, in various ways, but not through liturgical experimentation. That doesn't seem to me like a good way of trying to solve these problems. Well, yeah. See, that's a complicated question because there is the symbolic aspect, and I fully admit that, um, you know, that drinking is not the same as eating, and uh, a liquid is not the same as a food, and blood is not the same as the body, and all of this is true, and Catholics know it to be true, um, at least at some level. You know, that's that's a, a kind of an obvious point. Um, and yet, at the same time, we have to ask, what kind of liturgical practices are most appropriate if we're going to be giving communion at all to large numbers of people? Uh, and I, I think you know the East and the West developed two very different approaches to this question. As I'm sure you know this, but I'll mention it for for everybody here. You know, in in the in the Byzantine world, the Eastern rites in general, um, the laity do receive under both kinds, both species, but. That's because they use leavened bread, so they use a loaf of bread that is absorptive, like typical bread, leavened bread, and the priest cuts it up into cubes and puts the cubes into the chalice, and then he administers the, the, the cube of bread soaked in the wine into the mouth of the communicant with the spoon. So it's still communion in the mouth, although standing, because in the Byzantine East, standing for them They've always stood for their liturgy. I mean, some, in fact, the traditional Byzantine way is to stand for the entire liturgy from the first moment to the last moment. They, they only kneel for penitential occasions. Um, and so they have found a very reverent way to give communion to both species. Uh, the West never developed that form of intention. It, it, well, I, I mean, that, but the ordinary is a more recent development. I'm just saying, in terms of like just actual Western history, the the chalice and the host were always kept separately in in two vessels, and so to communicate from the chalice would mean essentially to pass the chalice around or to to give out the chalice, and and that has I think was perceived by the church. We have we have evidence that indicates that already by the ninth century, the early ninth century, um, some people would say before then that uh, there was a hesitation to, because of practical reasons, of the difficulty of having enough wine, of not spilling the wine, of how are you going to not, they, they didn't want to give the cup, the chalice to the faithful just to take it and drink it like a regular drink, right? Um, for the, some of the reasons that I gave here. So I guess what I'm saying is there are, there are competing issues and possibly even competing symbolisms here. And the, the solution of the Western Church, which I think is very consistent with Western, with, a, with the Western kind of pragmatic mentality, is Jesus is present, whole and entire, under both kinds. Uh, and therefore, if you receive the host, you're not actually receiving any less of Jesus. Um, and I think that truth, that truth is crucial because people now, I think some Catholics are in danger of having an erroneous view that if they, if they don't receive under both kinds, they're not receiving all of Jesus or something like that. That doesn't really make sense, right? I, I know, I, 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 I guess I was trying to agree with you to some extent, but not to the extent of saying that I think it's a good idea to change the, the, the traditional practice in the West. Um, it does seem to me possible, it, like in an alternative universe maybe, <laughs> that the West could have developed, or even could have developed after the Second Vatican Council, intinction at the traditional rite, because that can be done. The priest can dip the host into the precious blood and give it, to the, put it on the tongue of the communicant with the patent present. It, can, it that could have been done. The problem is there was such a an explosion of problems in the liturgy after the council that we haven't had the peace, the calm in which to sort of resettle and rethink about these things. So, I mean, to be honest, I think right now the traditional movement is just sort of battening the hatches and saying, let's stick with what was working for many centuries and let's get out of this period of turmoil and tumult 
And so it might be possible that what you're describing could happen 100 years from now, but I don't think it's going to happen right now. Um, there was one other point I wanted to make about this. Um, oh, just to make a clarification that, at, that Vatican II didn't actually say that the chalice should be extended to the faithful in a broad way, in a, in a general way, but it just said that there should be certain special occasions on which the faithful would also partake of, of the precious blood. Yes. Um, I mean, I, in some ways, it seems to me that the same principles would apply in the ecclesiastical sphere as apply in the domestic sphere. That is to say, how should one correct one's own father if he goes astray, which of course can happen given the abuse of, of human freedom and, and vice and you know various things. Um, and so, I mean, when you read when you read spiritual authors talking about this delicate subject, and St. Thomas takes this up, can subjects ever criticize their superiors, is the way he phrases the question. Um, you know, he, he really, the, the authors really emphasize that the manner in which it's done needs to be respectful of the authority of the person to whom you're addressing the criticism or the rebuke. Um, it needs to be clear that this is not a personal vendetta. This is not based on emotion. You have to state why. What's the reason? You know, it, you, in other words, you, it needs to be clear and respectful um, to make it so that it doesn't, as I say, it doesn't look like it's just you have a personal vendetta or an emotional uh, um, you know, um, temper about this person. Uh, yeah, so I mean, there, there is a way to do it, I guess, the manner in which it's done, the circumstances, how it's done. Um, do you, so for example, if you have a problem with a bishop, do you take it first to a television station or a radio and, 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 let, and sort of let him have it in front of the whole public? Well, no, if you do that, you're just going to make an enemy. You won't win him over. So, so there's also that process that, that our Lord talks about in the Gospels of going first to the person directly before you go to anyone else. Right, um, so I, I just think that, that when we think about it, we can sort of come up with a list of these are the ways we should act. These are the things we should do. There, there also, I think, is some, I think Saint Thomas says, you also have to ask yourself, am I the best person or the right person to do this? Because there might actually be somebody who's better positioned to do it. Um, and he says, if there is someone you know who's better pos positioned to do it, you should ask him to do it. Um, and so, so, so for example, him, you, you'll appreciate this, Father. You know, you, a lay person might go to, a, to his pastor and say, Father, I'm really disturbed about this thing that the bishop said or did. What should I do? And could you help me? And would you talk to him? Something like that, right? So that you're not just acting solely by your own lights, but also with, with counsel. That's right. Thomas says you should get counsel, too. You should get you know, advice from a prudent person. So. It sounds complicated, but I think it's common sense. Actually, when at the at the at the end of the day, Saint Thomas is you know is the saint of common sense. Yeah, back there. So, so really, the I feel as if the most important things that need to be done are all of the things I talked about tonight, uh, or any of the things I talked about tonight, um, and. And the difficulty is that there seems to me to be an incredibly stubborn unwillingness to address these things and to address the psychological and sociological and anthropological aspects of these questions of how we worship and what, we, what we're doing and what the meaning of it is. Um, and so, I, I mean, I, I don't want to sound too much like a pessimist, but if these, if these sorts of issues, which are the most basic and the most obvious when you look at it, if they're not addressed, I don't think like a note put into a book or something is really going to have much of an effect, or even a, an announcement. Um, in fact, I, I, that there was once an occasion when I myself was responsible for making a booklet like that for an event, and I put in a notice about, I just basically copied it from the U.S. bishops about you know, who should receive communion, and I found out afterwards that there were people who were offended by it, and they went to communion specific, I mean, almost in spite of it. Like, like you know, who, are, who is, 
who, who is anyone to tell me that I shouldn't go to communion? So it seems to me, my observation is, when you go to a Latin Mass, and there's a hushed stillness, and the priest and the servers are in the sanctuary, and everything is very orderly and very solemn and very serious, and the communion begins and people are kneeling up there at the rails, and they've got their hands under the housing cloth, if there is a housing cloth, and, you know, and the priest is coming down with the server and the patent. It all looks so serious that I think some people think twice about, should I go up and receive? They feel uncomfortable if they're not, if they're not used to it, and they're not thinking sort of in sync with the liturgy. It, it might actually be a bit um, off-putting for them. And I think that's good. We need that first. Right? We, we need, I think, as I said in my, my talk, we need first to have the sense of, um, of maybe this is not for me, but, but, and yet that it's fascinating, and you kind of wonder why, and why are these people so focused, and why are they so earnest, and why, you know, why are they praying so hard? It, that, that's the kind of thing that could actually begin a conversion process, it seems to me. Um, but I want to address one other thing you said, which I think, I, I can't emphasize this enough. People are too focused on numbers, on statistics, and they think that a movement that comprises one or two percent of Catholics cannot possibly have an effect or as big an effect as 98 percent of Catholics. I want to disagree with that fundamentally. Church history shows exactly the opposite. In church history, every great reform movement that has transformed the world has begun with one or a few people. Right? And I'll give you a great example of this. Uh, I think it's a great example because it's not as well known um, as, say, Jesus picking 12 apostles you know, to, to start the church, which, which now numbers you know, billions of people. Um, but uh, the Cluniac reform in the Middle Ages, okay, so in the, in the, in the early Middle Ages, monasticism was, new, was somewhat falling apart. Um, Europe was a mess. The papacy was a mess. Uh, there was a lot of reform needed. The reform did not come from Rome. It did not come from a pastoral program of a bishop's conference, because there were no bishop's conferences. Um, uh, thanks be to God. No, sorry, just that. Uh, but um, the, the the reform came from a monastery, Cluny, one monastery, with a group of zealous monks who completely turned the place around. Their zeal turned it into this powerhouse of monastic observance and prayer. The monks from there went out all over the world, found other monasteries, other monasteries that didn't come from Cluny started wondering what the fuss was and decided to become associated with Cluny. And pretty soon the whole map of Europe and the whole state of the church was trans transformed because of the Cluniac reform, and it lasted for centuries. Um, so I guess I give that as an example of the really important movements in history, by the way, both for good and for evil, right? Think about like Marx, Karl Marx, you know, like you could, you could think about just individuals who have had this, this larger than life global impact for such, you know, for such huge p portions of history. So it's always the minor, it's the creative minority, as Ratzinger called it, that makes a difference in the long run. Not the 98% who might be going through the motions, I mean, or better, but they might be kind of going through the motions, but they're not actually leaving a decisive mark on the church in their time, and they're not going in any direction. They're not they're not leading, they're not inspiring, they're not starting as the seed of a great plant, right? That's how it goes. Yeah, I, I think there, the question, why are the bishops not doing the obvious things? Uh, the, the, the things that are, like, why are they not addressing the elephants in the room, and why are they not implementing the, the most basic changes? I, I think in most cases it comes down to they're either too wedded to the old paradigm. I, I talked about that a little bit in connection with Vatican II. They're so wedded to it, they've sacrificed everything for it, and to, to, to turn around now and admit that, they, that they've been wrong for decades, is that's a bitter medicine to swallow, and that takes a lot of humility. 
um, to say, you know what, the direction we've been going in has been the, the wrong direction. We need to turn around, eat humble pie, turn around and, and go in a different direction. The other thing is inertia, the inertia of groups, right? I mean, there's a reason why we, we use this image of, of a pack of lemmings that's going off a cliff, right? The, a bishop's conference is like a pack of lemmings, okay? They just run in one direction. They all go in the same direction. And every once in a while, uh, like a bishop pops out of the consensus and he says something. He dares to say something different and everybody else, you know, stares at him with, you know, wicked glances. And that's, you know, that's kind of how it goes. So I, I, I think if you put together group inertia with an unwillingness to, 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 be, to eat humble pie, then you put those two things together, and that is actually quite a compelling explanation of why these things are not addressed.